I think, you know, I think when we were talking about the behaviors of people and propaganda and whatnot, it is really tied to, it's not just, you know, capitalism as the sort of structure that we operate within, but it's also just a particular manifestation of capitalism as well over the past, what, since like the 1970s or so, you know, neoliberal capitalism became kind of the, the kind of form that capitalism was going to take and uh, how it was going to manifest itself in, in many different countries. And it was often imposed violently or through coercive methods um, mm. in countries that were engaging in some form of maybe capitalism, but maybe more state-controlled capitalism or or maybe a mm. Keynesian kind of model, whatever it was, right? I mean, there's all the different models, but like over time, you know, publicly funded institutions and things that were kind of seen as like intrinsic to maintaining a robust society, <laughs> Um, began to become, you know, became kind of stripped down for to its parts and commodified and, you know, basically privatized, right? So there was, yeah, I think when, it, maybe it, it shouldn't be surprising, but it is because I think we're kind of all living in the moment. But when, yeah, when a novel virus spills over into human populations in 2020, we've been on this neoliberal capitalist kind of path for, 30 plus years or whatever, you know, 50 years, whatever it was. So at that point, mm. you get to that point where, you know, a pandemic cannot be adequately addressed. Um, and yeah, it just becomes another, as you describe it, there's another layer, you know, you have what is, you know, the effects of climate disruption as it gets more and more severe, ecological breakdown and collapse, as well as mass infection that is causing mass disability and mass death and, you know, the system is just becoming increasingly weighed down with these, you know, it's just like it's intersecting, right? So, yeah, yeah, at a certain point, you know, it's like when do these parts really begin to come together to create a sort of collapse scenario? And I think that's kind of what we're witnessing right now is like there's all these different layers of crises that are starting to really impact the the system in really profound ways that um, I don't think can it, it can't really adapt to, you know, and it can't really move through. Um, and we don't even have the kind of mental uh, framework, I guess, or the ability to psychologically comprehend or deal with it either on a social level because of the kind of the effects of neoliberalism in, in many ways. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it just sort of like as more crises really begin to accumulate and 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 affect our ability to live and and kind of continue on as before um yeah you know it i'm sorry i'm having a hard time kind of articulating what i'm trying to say here um it just it it, it just feels like the pandemic is not just this event it is a it is a, another layer in the collapse that we're kind of in the midst of right now yeah yeah i i agree and i think i know where you are with with that sort of maybe unformed thought, which is <laughs> you know, around around people's around the collective ability to analyze where we are and to understand that the pandemic is just an outgrowth of, or the pandemic response, I should say, is just an outgrowth of you know of that of that neoliberal capitalist system that has been imposed upon us for the last sort of forty plus years. You know, we didn't we didn't choose this. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it is it is it is difficult sometimes to explain it to people. You know, you can't just say to people, look, the reason why you're not wearing a, a mask because is because you don't understand neoliberal capitalism. It just sounds ridiculous. But <laughs> in some way, that is exactly why someone isn't wearing a mask, even if they don't know it. It doesn't just sound ridiculous. It also sounds, you know, a bit patronizing and a yeah. bit snooty. Mm -hmm. But but it is kind of the reality. It's that a, the ability to analyze things from the perspective of power and capital and class has been deliberately stripped away from people over the last 40 plus years. That is one of the goals of the neoliberal project. It is to take away from people their ability to analyze why things are happening in the way that they're happening. I mean, it was the goal of Margaret Thatcher and her destruction and, and Reagan uh, of the mm -hmm. unions. Mm -hmm. You know, the explicit goal was to divide the working class so that they couldn't organize effectively. And by doing that, you take away people's ability to analyze 
the problems that are affecting your class in the way that is necessary. And so, of course, 40 plus years down the line, we get a pandemic and the response reflects that. And not just the response from the ruling class, but the response from a lot of people. And it's not, again, it just sounds patronizing, but it's not people's fault. You know, it's not their fault that they can't analyze this mm-hmm. from that perspective of power and capital and, and, and yeah, and, cl- and class and social stratification. It's just not their fault. No, we've not been taught that. Most people have not been taught that. You know, if you if you're able to do it, it's because. Well, I know in my case, I got lucky. I got lucky. I came, you know, I'm from a working class background, but I studied actually in the US for a year. Mm. And one of my professors there was just, you know, the most, um, you know, the most radical and enlightening uh, teacher that I've ever had in my life and introduced me to all sorts of different, you know, radical analysis about the world, uh, texts that I would never have come across otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just got lucky because my my university um, education in the UK had not been like that. Of course, my high school, my secondary school, as we call it in the UK, education had not been like that. It had been queen this, king that, queen this, king that, World War II, Cold War end. You know, I had no I had no understanding of um, of 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 what it meant to live in a neoliberal world. And so, yeah, I got lucky in some way, perhaps you can look back at your life and realize there were moments where you were exposed to information that really was kind of just by luck maybe a bit of your own curiosity as well Mm -hmm. but a lot of people if they haven't fallen into those moments um and are not able to you know are not able to undertake that kind of analysis and so that's another reason why i try not to you know as hard as it is you look around i was wearing a mask you know i try i try not to you know, to, to, to blame people too much, because as I say, that ability to analyze the situation has been deliberately taken away over the last 40 years. Yeah. 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 I think that this seems to be a common yeah, thing that's coming up over and over again, which could not have really been planned in this uh, conversation, but is that it is about empathy. It is about having kind of that understanding of human nature and why, why you know I, I think this is sort of the this is the tension i have in myself and, and it's never it hasn't been resolved you know in the past four plus years it seems like it's I've, I have become able to understand it better but that feeling of like well yes like there's reasons why people are behaving the way they are and why they're taking they're they're, t- they're actually engaging in more risk than i think they realize in their day-to-day activities right Um, and the fact that is, is it'd be one thing if like, I could kind of look at that from a distance, say, oh, those people are acting this way. I see why they're acting that way, but it obviously intersects with me as an individual and you as an individual, and it affects my partner. It affects everyone. So like on a certain level, walking around and having to take up more caution, you're kind of, I think if you're more covid conscious and more willing to take on the precautions required to try to you know act responsibly you know you have to take on more so now it's like disabled mm-hmm. people especially like they are like i can't fuck around with this i have to be very very careful in how i conduct my life and they always had to but the risks got infinitely higher when the pandemic started for many people and that group has also gotten larger because of the amount of people that have gotten long COVID now. So it's this incredible thing. And it's it's just, again, that the speaking to this tension of being aware of why it is the way. I think that many people can spend a lot of energy and, and time thinking, why are people so callous? Why are people like this? Why are people like that? Um, I've certainly felt that way. But regardless of that, you know, for people that are trying to basically survive a pandemic, um, it is a, a very challenge. It, it, it becomes increasingly challenging as more and more people try to uh, return to some yeah. sense of normalcy, something that resembles normalcy to them anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would never deny someone's kind of outrage, right? If, you know, as you say, there are lots and lots of vulnerable people who are basically being kind of um, sacrificed in this situation for the return to normal. And so I would never, yeah. I would never denigrate right. or um, scold them for being annoyed at quote unquote people, because of course it's their life and it is a, mm-hmm. 
you know, it is a, a, a huge situation of risk that they've now been plunged into mm-hmm. by by this by the the situation that surrounds them and by people's actions and activities or non-actions, um, I should say. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. That, that, all of those those expressions of outrage are absolutely valid for sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I tried to just sort of situate it all in 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 that broader social political context, which does exist. You know, people have said to me, "It's just about putting on a mask," and it it is, but it isn't. You know, and mm-hmm. and it's again, it's it's quite hard sometimes to sort of really get into the weeds, especially if it's online about stuff like that. And so that's why these sorts of conversations are are, are really good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think it's interesting too because it's like. There's a lot of, um, we're going to talk about like larger social attitudes and things like this, but like on a, on an individual level, like it was interesting. I had this, um, this brought this up, I guess I'm just going to bring this in because I had a job. Uh, I, I there was a job I had of, uh, before I moved to where I am now, I, I worked at a, at a community college. I was just a part-time job. So I worked with a lot of younger, like, like college age students, you know, and they're like late teens, early twenties. And a lot of the people I worked with were, yeah, like 10 or so years younger than me, right? They're like, you know, 20s or whatever. And um, there's this one guy, and, and he, he, I mean, he got on my nerves a lot for, for a lot of reasons, but, um, you know, he the mask mandates were lifted, and I was very much wearing a mask, and I was kind of bothered by the fact that this person would just go around and talk to everybody all the time, and I just felt like unsafe, honestly. I was like, you're just kind of... <laughs> just, I'm over here just trying to like be cautious and you're not right. And, um, anyway, it got to a, a point where I had to kind of have a conversation with them and it was facilitated by one of the people that the boss is at this job. And, and basically the point of this story is that the reason this person did not like wearing masks is that it brought up, I don't know if they said it this way, but it was sort of described almost like trauma. They had a traumatic experience. Like it was, it was a really negative feeling that they got from wearing it, for a combination of reasons. And I've heard this from a lot of people, which is that they associate the mask with a very, very difficult time, which was, you know, from twenty twenty to through twenty twenty one, I guess, when these mandates were lifted in the U.S. Right. So there's a visceral feeling. It's a it's a very emotional response, which again I kind of understand. But, um, you know, I think that this sort of ties into just how utterly difficult it is to sort of navigate this period right now because there is this sense that people, when, when the plagues hit, and this has been true throughout, I think, through many different periods of, uh, of time, you know, all the way back, you can read some of the early, like, some of the records that have been written by historians and, like, ancient you know, society is about when plagues rip through the population and, and they're like, they write about it. And then, you know, there's sort of this sense that people are willing, are trying to forget that experience. One of the most profound things I kind of learned about the 1918 pandemic was that people were really willing to almost remember World War I, which is a horrific war involving tremendous amounts of organized violence against people. They were more willing mm-hmm. to acknowledge and commemorate that act of brutality than a pandemic would actually kill more people than from mm. combat, from what I understand. So there's something about pandemics in particular that are so, I don't know what it is, but something in human psychology, like we have a very difficult time learning lessons from it and um, remembering it and and really like... I remember like New York Times, they did this thing like when a million people died in the U.S. from COVID, they said, you know, incalculable loss. They put all the names of the people that recorded dying from COVID on the, you know, front page of the mag, uh, of the, of that edition. Uh, Or maybe it wasn't even a million. It was like less than that. They, they, it was some number. And they said, this was like, you know, a threshold we crossed. And then we, I think when we crossed a million deaths in the U.S., there was like hardly a mention. It was, it was an (laughs) interesting contrast to see like, where's the line where the number gets so high that it becomes so abstracted that we don't even try to mourn or grieve that? And I, I'm just curious about your, maybe what you've researched or thought about, because I, I've been reading a book about the 1918 pandemic. It's been really fascinating to read that history, but I'm curious like, if you had any insights as to, like, yeah, the sort of psychology of like what it is that's so difficult about human beings to really remember or think about mm. 
plagues, you know? Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting just um, to say my dogs might start barking because I can hear a fox outside. So if they do, um, I that might is be such myself, but... that is a that is such a you know what? I'm sorry, I just got a little snapshot into your life. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dogs are out. We, we let them out. They're barking. They're running. Okay. Um, they're fenced off. They can't actually chase the fox. So they just have to stand at the fence and bark at it. Yeah. Um, so yes. Uh, yeah, the, the the New York Times front page was was interesting. I think, or I wonder to what extent that's related to the fact that those first whatever it was half a million deaths were under Trump, and then the second half a million passing the million were under Biden, and yeah. so it was more of a politicized statement or non statement. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know maybe it's about who um, protagonists, non protagonists, who we can pin agency onto. There are no good guys and bad guys in a in a pandemic or at least there are no you know there are less visible active agents causing the organized violence and death this is a thing that kind of comes out of of nature uh, most likely and then it sort of disperses literally through the air randomly taking out people and that's the other thing in you know organized violence you sort of understand why people die and 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 the the chain of events that lead up to that process, especially mm-hmm. if they're conscripted into militaries, but a pandemic, including the COVID pandemic, it's so it's so random who dies and and who is most harmed. You know, you can have someone, as I know, who is triple vaccinated, gets the mild quote unquote Omicron, and is 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 completely taken out to this day. Uh, mm-hmm. by the you know the, the most severe form of long covid the kind of the chronic fatigue syndrome um me style of long covid and then you can have unvaxxed people who you know are sailing through seemingly sailing through anyway two or three infections or someone who's you know who's much older yeah um, who doesn't get infected so it's that complete random nature mm. of the of the experience i think which is it is quite traumatizing and it's hard for people to really wrap their heads around and it's hard for it's hard for us to when you can't sort of, you know, directly pin blame on an adversary, ad, adversary, adversary mm. for for a death. You know, it, it it becomes hard to then understand how you should react to mm. what is to what is going on, um, and yeah, I suppose there is also no obvious endpoint. A war has some kind of resolution, usually, right? A peace a peace agreement that Mm. definitively ends that period of history. And so, you know, from that point on, the ways that people were dying yesterday are not going to be repeated tomorrow. Whereas again, a a pandemic, it's it's not like that. There is no definitive end. The end of a pandemic, as we've seen, is, is more of a social construction than an epidemiological construction. We sort of just decide as a society how much death we're willing to put up with, how much um, how much suffering we're willing to bear, and then we declare the you know the royal we again. But society, in some way, declares the pandemic over, and we and we move forward. But 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 we can't really move beyond the death because you know that's not how it works. The virus is still in circulation. Mm-hmm. So under those conditions, I think it becomes really hard for people to continue to um, act in the way that they acted when the threat was new obvious and 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 very much um present uh, especially you know in those first few months mm-hmm. we really did have the sense that this was something new and i think people for the most part you know reacted with a sense of social solidarity collectivism there was that 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 understanding that the only way that we could deal with this was was collectively um, but that quickly that quickly petered out or that quickly was, um, I wouldn't say petered out, I would probably say it was, you know, engineered out of mm-hmm. society by various different interests who who recognised actually the threat to to their capital operations and the threat to the, the threat to business as usual, that that kind of prolonged collective social, socially solid response, um, the threat that that, that, that uh, posed to to you know to their money making machines i mm-hmm. guess um so then you had the barrage of, of propaganda which supported people's desire to move on so when they were you know when we're told it's a cold when we're told it's basically over with with vaccines when we're told that 
masks are no longer necessary because now we have the tools, we've got the vaccines and we've got other treatments. Well, people, I think, understandably um, ran with that. They wanted to, to move on from this thing. They wanted to be told that there was a clear kind of end in sight. This was the end. And now we move on to the next phase in our, you know, in our glorious in our glorious sort of trajectory of progress um, mm-hmm. in, in the common imaginary. Uh, so, yeah, some, some, some random thoughts, I guess, about the differences between war and, and pandemics. 